Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So we're going to open this episode a little bit differently because I am sitting in a Hawker Hunter. And I am very, very happy indeed. And it's a live one. It is a G11, I think he says. That's probably a bit wrong. But this is one of the classic British jet collections running classic British jets, really. So later in the show, you're going to hear it running. We're going to do a whole thing where basically it's a few interviews and then a lot of noise on this podcast, everybody. So... <laughs> Please be ready for that. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Mainly for this intro, I'd like to thank the team here, Dave Thomas and uh, Mark Etienne, for inviting me down. You're not going to hear from them today, but you're going to hear from some of the other members of the team, talking about some of the aircraft, what they do here, and then, like I said, lots of noise but it's been a fantastic day the sun has been out this beauty that i'm sitting in now was fired up and turned petrol into noise which is just what you want for these sorts of things so without further ado i'll hand you over but i'm going to have a bit of a due because i'm just going to explain this if you've not sat in a hunter before the hunter is hawkers in my mind masterpiece jet fighter that yeah, everyone talks about the Harrier but for me this thing is just the most incredible thing it's been in service for years it's still used as an aggressor aircraft now but it's it's just right the lines are right I'm sitting in the cockpit now and I'm six foot one and a little bit more weight than I should be so it's not ideal so for example my shins are catching the bottom of the instrument panel but it's funny you look around it and there's a lot of dials in here so the undercarriage indicator off to my left things like that would not be out of place in a, in a typhoon or a tempest. But it's it's just really tidy and everything is in easy arm. But, um, I was sat in the Civics and they have here earlier and it looks like they've just thrown a bunch of stuff together for that one. But here it has a place and it works. But then again, I'm sat here also in a Hawker t-shirt. So there's that. But, like I said, it's going to be a lot of fun, I hope, this episode. We're going to come back uh, for a future episode, sit down with Dave and discuss the collection here, um, how it came about, play around some more of the aircraft, and a little bit more of a one-to-one. -one. It's just a bit of a busy day with a near full house and the air cadets here cr crawling all over everything. But that is what we're going to do. So, like I said, I don't think I'm going to have any interviews. I could just sit here and tell you just how wonderful this is for another minute, actually. Okay, so, Hawker Hunter cockpit, there we go. Control column in front of me, selectors, safe selections, trigger on the side, brakes on the back, I guess, I don't know. Um, flying panel there, all the usuals down here on the right. Radios, various modes, things like that. Fuel gauges, oxygen gauge back on there. Anti-G, the G-suits things down there. Emergency settings. Um, this on the side there with a little map box down the bottom. Um, oil pressure, compass, then over here, flap control. I think that's the canopy jettison. Um, undercarriage indicators, and the most wonderful undercarriage <laughs> display there, which, let's face it, I don't think a hawker has changed ever. Uh, down over here, throttle, radio button, jet provost firing up over there. And back in here, flaps, low pressure cock, and the bits on the back. And then if we just have a look around, incredible visibility from it, because you're nice and forward in the aircraft and you're not really having too much intrusive. No gun sight or anything in there, but this aircraft is a live one, so all of this good stuff works, and it was running earlier. There's not really a lot of room, but I don't want to get out, and I have to get on the road in a minute, because I'm recording this at the end of the day. <laughs> but now I'm in this thing. I'm a happy boy. But it may be the end of my day, but it's just the beginning of this episode. So we'll hand it over now, and... Maybe we'll start with some noise. I don't know. We'll see what happens in the edit. Catch you later.
Okay. Tell me your name, good Brian sir. Brian Johnstone. Well, Brian, we're stood next to your lovely vixen here. What's her story? Uh, well, I uh, joined the Navy in 1967, and in 1968 ended up at Yeovilton working on the Sea Vixen. And it's one of those aircraft that is sort of mixed history. It had sort of an inauspicious start with poor old John Derry at, at Farnborough, but yeah, then sure. went on to a long service with the Navy. It did, yes. I mean, it lost the contract with the RAF that went to the Javelin, uh, and the Navy decided to take up the Sea Vixen. Um, the Sea Vixen was much the better aircraft over the Javelin, um, and obviously they, they developed it over the years. This is a Mark II. They started with a Mark I. The significant difference that is visual is these large extensions to the booms. Mm -hmm. um, and with the Mark II, they contain a mixture of fuel, plus behind the fuel, extra um, electronics to, for the Red Top missile, which was the maiden modification between the one and the uh, and the Mark II. Uh, the Mark I flew with red fire streak missiles, but the Mark II uh, had the updated red top missile, but could still also fly with uh, fire streak if they wanted to. So its primary role, fleet defence? Fleet defence. Uh, it also had a uh, strike capability. It could carry a range of bombs, rockets and missiles, and it was even a uh, nuclear capable aircraft. It's, it's one of those ones that is sort of talked about mostly because of its looks, isn't it? Because it is it is one of those typically, being a Canadian, an eccentric British design. Oh, without, <laughs> without a doubt. I mean, it, it's uh, the granddaddy of the, the twin boom aircraft from the Everland with the, the Vampire, then the Venom, and then their much bigger grandfather, the Sea Vixen. I remember as a young chap seeing, seeing the flying one doing its displays back in the day before it, it, its tragic accident. But for you working with this one now, what's she like? She's still temperamental or? Oh, she... very, <laughs> uh, uh, very complex aircraft. Um, and of course, this one particularly, it, it sits out all day in the weather. So you've mm. got, you're always battling corrosion, you know, which plays havoc with cable systems and things like that. So uh, yeah, this, this one is, um, difficult to maintain over one that's, uh, you know, regularly maintained and kept in a nice warm hangar. The history on this particular aircraft, what's, what's her story specifically as opposed to just fixing it? Well, she ser served with the 899 Squadron in HMS Eagle, um, but then around about 1968 she was withdrawn from naval service um, as a frontline aircraft and went to Boscombe Down as a development aircraft. So it was used in the development of the Martel missile. And there are a few modifications you can see on the aircraft to do with that, such as the camera nose, mm -hmm. uh, and also the uh, wave guides that you can see from the back of that pylon running down the underside of the wing and then down the side of the, uh, the booms. So uh, it, it's a bit of a hybrid aircraft because although it's a Mark II, it didn't go on to have the uh, Mark Two style frangible hatch. Um, it's got the original Mark I hatch, but it is a Mark II aircraft, so uh, it, it's a bit of a one off. It's a special one for all that ex extra development history in there as well. And, yeah. Yeah, and now, she's, now she's here ready to turn petrol into noise sometimes. Well, hopefully, yes. <laughs> I mean, at the moment, one engine is good to go, but the other engine is reluctant to start. So uh, we're probably going to have to do a burner change. We have the burners. It's just finding the time now to take the engine out, switch burners, put it back in, and then hopefully try it again and uh, see if that kills the problem. And the engines are what? Rolls-Royce Avon. Um, we just heard the camera start. That's yep. Rolls-Royce Avon. And so is this Rolls-Royce Avon. They're all slightly different marks, but in, um, otherwise it's the same engine. Yep. The, and the one in the Sea Vixen, is the most powerful of all the uh, Avon range of engines um, that are unre unreated. The Lightning has Avons as well, but the 310 comes with reheat, which makes them more powerful. The Sea Vixen, 11,500 pound of thrust, whereas the Hunter would be something like 8,000 pound of thrust. We were chatting earlier, your, your career took you onto the Phantom afterwards. What's 
the quirks of say an American aircraft versus a British one that you uh, sort of very noticed? much easier to maintain. Right. Quick release couplings, for instance, for the ground uh, hydraulic rigs to connect to, as opposed to um, uh, Avery couplings, uh, they're called, on the Sea Vixen. Very di difficult to undo and do up because you need a sea spanner. And while you're doing it, it usually pours hydraulic fluid all over you while you're doing it. <laughs> and it's, it's good, good old school hydraulic fuel that sort of burns and corrodes and yeah, gets well, everywhere. Well, it's the same yeah. fluid in, in, in all these military jets, OM-15, but uh, yes. <laughs> Fun times. Super. Well, good luck with the engine change and we hope to hear a burst into life sometime. Next time future. maybe. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Super. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Fairchild A-10 Thunderbolt II or Warthog. Um, the A-10 was designed specifically as a tank buster ground attack aircraft. Um, it's one of those aircraft that's kind of has pretty good story. I mean, people either really love this aircraft because it's kind of unique. I mean, they got a titanium bathtub that the pilot's sitting in to protect him. Got a 30 mil millimeter Gatling gun that fires um, 4,200 rounds per minute, which means they can run out of ammo pretty quickly, short bursts. Um, <clears throat> could carry a slew of different types of weapons. And it's been upgraded over the years. These early A models had really kind of limited um, sensors and targeting equipment. It was kind of really kind of brute force. Um, but over the years, they've upgraded them and made them more adaptable for night combat and fu uh, firing more high-tech weapons. It's an aircraft that, to be fair, the Air Force has often tried to get rid of, um, which is why I think A-10 pilots are kind of a unique breed of pilots because they kind of always feel like they're uh, the ones that the Air Force is, you know, they're not, they're not flying the pointy bass jets and stuff like that. But, you know, in Desert Storm, and then again in the Middle East, the A-10 really proved itself. Um, you know, the A-10 was often the aircraft that ground troops would call in specifically when they needed ground support. Sometimes just the A-10 coming in, firing its cannon and quick burst was enough to disperse enemy forces. But, and also here in Tucson, Arizona, we are kind of what they consider the spiritual home for the A-10. Davis Moffin Air Force Base has always been the training base and the big base for A-10s. Um, that has allowed us over the years to, you know, foster a lot of good relationships with A-10 pilots. Um, another interesting exhibit we have here is the Bing, which is all the stuff that they brought back from Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. They essentially had their own little pilots club. Um, so all the patches that they would leave and uh, unit uh, memorabilia was brought back here for us to recreate a kind of display of their officers club. So the A-10 here is kind of the heart of our Arizona aviation exhibit for good reason.
To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Okay, cool. Right, so if you can give me your name. Yeah, I'm Christian. I've been here four and a half years now. Started at 14, doing basically holding spanners because I wasn't <laughs> old enough to do anything. Um, first day I was here, Dave chucked me in the JP and ran it, which was trial by fire and ignited it, really. I'm, I've not stopped coming since and I love it. Um, more recently, with, along with Julian, one of the volunteers, I've been doing a lot of more physical maintenance stuff. So mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot on the Venom, done a lot on the Meteor, just fixing stuff and making sure it's all working properly. Uh, and then I've ran and taught how to run the JP and the Meteor as well. So that's top end. I never thought I'd get to do that ever. So I enjoy it. So what brought you in, into it in the first place? Was it love of aircraft or just chance, really? Uh, I, I always liked looking at them, but it was, <laughs> it was always from afar, and it was pure chance that my mum found Dave's phone number from a friend. I gave him a call when I was 14 and said, I need volunteering from a DV. Can I come down? He said, yeah, of course. And then it's just it's all spiralled from there for good or bad. So you've, you've sort of Hotel California, you've got in and you can't leave. Yeah, that's what Dave always says. We've got you now, you're not allowed to leave. But I, I wouldn't choose to. I love it. It does seem like you're having a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. It's days like this open day, uh, top end. This is what we work for to get, because we run them often enough, just closed doors, only people here. And it's, it's good, but to have the public here and enjoy it and we can get that income back to keep them running for a lot longer, it's, there's nothing beating it. So what's the complications of having a load of us oiks hanging around trying to get into a good place to get a photo? Logistics of moving cars and people is the big one. To have, I think we've got 120 cars or so here and trying to get them through one double gate and that's the only exit as well is quite strange. Ben's done a brilliant job with that. Um, but then moving people around when we have to move because we're in a, such a small area, it's everyone's got to move to one place so we can move an aircraft and then they'll move back and then every time an aircraft moves, everyone else has got to move and it's just trying to get that done, pain in the ass. So of the collection, what's your favorite to play with? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah. Sophie's choice, come on. Uh, I like the Hunter visually. Good answer, and we'll move on. That's my favorite too. So. I, I like the Hunter. I've got to say, no one else likes it, really. I like the Venom, but that's because I've done the most on it. I've learned a lot from Julian on the Venom, so it's got a bit of a different place to me. But And you had your head in it all morning as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Trying to fix things, last minute problems that come up. Always have, but pain in the ass. So, okay, so what's, why why is the Hunter, which is my favourite jet of all time, yeah. why is that so problematic? Size of it almost. It's big, but it's not, and you get a lot of the Teleflex cable for the LP and HP cock is annoying because it seizes really easily. Mm -hmm. So you just got to constantly grease it, and we went through a big stage of, we don't know what's wrong, take the engine out, which is a big job, can't find anything, put the engine back in, won't work, take the engine out, until we started more regularly doing the grease gun on the Teleflex, but even then, you can leave it a month, do it once, and it will still be stiff. You've almost got to do it weekly to get it working, so it, it's a pain, but it's, it looks good enough that it, we don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and um, which one's the bastard of the group? Or are they all lovely and we're just going to be nice about uh, them? Well, yeah, they are all <laughs> lovely. Uh, the Sea Vixen's the... Yes. It, it's, that ran once. I've seen it run once, and that was only on one engine, because we've had a, there's been a problem with that engine for about 15 years. Mm. Still not sorted it. Hopefully, that will be this year, and there'll be another day for just be us, Sea Vixen. Hopefully invite some public down for the second time it runs, because it will be one of the only, still one of the only running Sea Vixens in the world, I think. So yeah. when that starts running 
that will be a big crowd draw, I think. Yeah. But it's getting it running. It's a long way to go. It's a big lump to get in and around. And Unfortunately, we've unfolded the wings and we've still not folded them back up. If they were folded up like it would be on an aircraft carrier, it would move easily. But, yeah, that's for after this open day. Yeah. Well, we'll have to come back for that. I'm Christian, thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. What's your name, sir? It's Benjamin Belburn. And what is your role here? Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Classic British Jet Collection. How did you get involved with this bunch of fantastic people and their fantastic toys? Um, so the original story is I came here with my father uh, for an open day in 1993. Um, and you never left? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, aviation was the, the bug the hobby, um, I built model planes mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then had to, you know, go to work and other things got involved and then I sort of started building model aeroplanes again. Uh, I actually built Dave's Hunter and put it on <laughs> Facebook, uh, and which invited me down one Saturday to, to see the aircraft run, mm -hmm. which to me was just fantastic. Because um, I didn't have to pay to come into Bruntingthorpe to see an aeroplane <laughs> run, so that was always, quite a nice bonus um, however in Dave's traditional subtle way right put your name and address here and I'll see you next week <laughs> and and I was there and I have been pretty much every Saturday for the past six and a half years Wow so yeah I should really get more hobbies this is a pretty good hobby. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great in the summer. It's yeah. awful in the winter. <laughs> and at Brunting Thought, there is more winter than there is summer. I, I can imagine, yeah. It's, um, we've got a lovely day for it today. It's not rained yet. Not yet. Yeah. It's, it's threatening, but yeah. it's, we uh, will see. It's April. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so for a day like today, this is the first open day since the other side of the pandemic, I suppose. So yeah, this is the first open day uh, on this site and it's also the first open day since we were on yeah, the old yeah. site in 2019, I believe, the August, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, everything's changed. For the better or the worse, um, we will see. Yeah. So the, the move over here, we've you, you've got a decent amount of space for, for all the aircraft. What goes into putting together the plan for a day like today? Because you got old aircraft, Lots of noise, lots of smoke, lots of people. Yep. How, how long has this day been in the planning? Uh, so originally it was always a, a, the idea of having an open day here. Um, the Lightning guys tested the water with their twilight run, but they only ran one aeroplane and it didn't, it wasn't moved around the public, it was yeah. static. Um, so we knew it could be done. Um, a lot of planning and a lot of measuring um, a lot of paperwork uh, just by the sheer volume of making sure that the public are safe and briefed because mm -hmm. the dynamics have changed and also the, the teams have had to adapt to this as well and we've had to get paperwork involved because if, if I didn't go down that route nobody would have an open day yeah. uh, and I want this place to be here for the next 35, 40, even longer years so it's it's imperative that we do it right and it's baby steps today it's gone really well so far 
Um, parking has been an issue, but not as big an issue as I thought it would be. But yeah, there's a lot of planning. It's also from our maintenance side of things, running the aircraft, working on them on the, the pan in front of the queue shed. Uh, we know roughly what would be the best one to run first and then sort of fall through the, the order and then the Lightning guys drag theirs out and that runs because it's at that point the pan's clear, they, they put theirs away. So yeah. it's, it's just looking at it with a, a sympathetic eye of how the day is going to progress. And it's, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of noise, which is great. And of course, raffled off the back seat in the Meteor, which is going next, which seems to go yeah. really well. Yeah, that's, that's gone really well. Um, raffling off the Meteor was an idea I've had for a while. It gives back to people. It's an idea that other teams have done. Um, and it, it, it seems to have worked quite well. Good. I didn't win. No. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit disappointed as well because I've not actually been in the back either. I've been in the front and started it though, so I shouldn't well, really complain that's more, too. Much. That's more fun. You can't, can't yeah. have it all your own. I've only done one engine though, they won't let me loose with two. <laughs> No, I'm really jealous. So, <laughs> it's, yeah, like we were saying, it, it seems to be a popular one. I, I guess this is, this is a good sign for more of these events in the future. It is certainly looking promising. Um, as we increase the car park, um, we, can, we can sort of make things flow a little better. It, it's, it's very promising. I'm not, I'm not gonna commit just yet because we've still got another three and a half hours to go. However, it's, it's all good news from what I've seen around, so. So we're gonna do the Sophie's Choice question. Okay. Which is your favorite of the collection to play around with and oh, see well. fire up on a day like today? So, my the absolute- The answer is Hunter. The, the, answer is, <laughs> the answer is a single seat GA11 Hunter because it just looks right and you sit in it and everything falls to hand. It feels right, it sounds great. Um, it's got the cartridge start, so it's that impact. Mm -hmm. it, it's really, really something to see. And as you've seen earlier, it's quite loud as well. I adore the Hunter. It's, 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 he says undoing his top as he's got a hocker yeah. t-shirt on well, underneath. But it, it, yeah, you're right, it just looks right. I mean, it does. And same sort of thing when you're in it, you don't feel that your hands have to travel very far yeah. for any of this. A, a lot of aeroplanes, I mean, I'm looking at the Sea Vixen now, and, and that, when you sit in that, looks like they've put the instruments in with a shotgun. Mm. Um, Hawk, the Hunter. I, I can get in the Sea Vixen better than I can the Hunter, though. That's, that is yeah. one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it get to your question. Yeah, it's it's going to be the hunter of any guys. Yeah, but a single seat GA11 is is pretty much the best it can be. I can't argue with you there. <laughs> so there's 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 no bribery, ladies and gentlemen, for this one. And I, I guess as we stood next to it, the plan for the Sea Vixen is to to hopefully finally get her back. Yeah. Going so again. so one of the engines works, uh, and it works brilliantly. The other well, engine, so much. the other engine has some some niggles. Um, hopefully, we can we can get to the bottom of them, and she's well overdue a repaint. 
Um, but because of her sheer size, she sort of just gets pushed back uh, in the list of, of aircraft to, yeah. to fettle with. Um, but I'd say at least 80% of the systems all work. It is box office, though, when it does work. I, me- I remember the, the flying one a little while ago before her accident. Yeah, she yeah. was just something else to see. Never saw it fly, Didn't unfortunately, you? no. Oh. I was, no. I'm, I'm showing my age <laughs> to be able to say that. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm 35 in August, oh, so... That's a butter babe, so that's a babe. <laughs> I look probably 405. But yeah, so it's it, that'll, be, that'll be a fun day. Double, yeah. double engine run would be on the yeah, cards for well, that. The, the plan for all the aircraft that we have in restoration, etc., are that we will, we will offer a dedicated day, whereas that is the star of the show, and mm. we will you know, run it maybe once or twice and the public can come in. And it's a, we, we did it for her, her birthday, I think, I think it was the 60th, mm. on the airfield, and we ran the Venom. We had a de Havilland Tiger Moth fly in. We had the de Havilland Comet that's on site, because it was a bit of a de Havilland day, yeah. and then the Sea Vixen ran, um, admittedly on one engine. But that's, that's the plan. We have other things in the, in the pipe work. Mm. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go around here. Oh. People don't believe I'm not I'm here if there's not noise <laughs> going on in the background. There's two uh, two sterile. Is that all right for you? Oh that's fine, yeah. But it'll be a day, you know, we'll just come around come around the back of the Vixen and it's it's those classic to have the lines, yeah, the, the venom has the same on the back as well. Very similar, it? yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. it'll be great when you guys get get that one happening. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of sourcing parts. You can't just pop down to Halfords and get <laughs> bits and bobs with this. Although we do seem to have quite the collection of aeroplane bits, so who knows? And she's overdue a repaint. Um, we'll we'll get all that sorted. She'll be absolutely amazing. Wonderful. Today's been great. Thanks for having me, Dan. No worries. Thank you very much. That was a lot of fun to record up at Bruntingthorpe with the team from the Classic British Jets collection. I've put the links to the Classic British Jets Facebook and Instagram pages for all the information for the team is there and when their next open day will be, which is worth checking out because they have got a fantastic collection of aircraft up there. So they've got the Sea Vixen, which we talked about, which is XJ494. She didn't run the glorious Hunter GA11 WT806, which, oh my goodness, she was beautiful. The Jet Provost, which didn't really run. It <laughs> tried to run while I was recording the intro, and the engine basically over a span, and uh, yeah, they shut it down pretty quickly. And of course, the glorious Venom with that beautiful Ghost 103 turbojet, designed by the same guy who did the Napier Sabre as well, which is always well worth mentioning. They've got a fantastic collection of aircraft I'll be sure to share when their next open day is. And of course, we're hoping to head up there soon. So many thanks to Mark Etienne who got in touch with me and extended the invite on behalf of Dave Thomas. And of course, to the guys we interviewed, I can't thank them for their time enough. Now, as always, I cannot thank everybody enough for their support of the podcast. You are all ace. Remember, stick some stars into your podcast app of choice. If you are on Apple Podcasts listening to this, please do leave a review and some stars. It does help things move up and down the charts quite nicely and of course the best way to share this is tell all your friends because your friends need to join us we're not quite a cult but it would be nice if we ended up there if you fancy supporting the podcast more directly there is of course patreon and you can become a damn cast here which is really a thing for just three pounds a month plus fat there's a few more tiers that gets you some stickers and things but everybody gets a little welcome pack from me with a signed thank you card from the fantastic aircraft team but that's it for this week next week we return to the empire flying boats with phil vabre we start looking more about the operation of them and what happened when the second world war broke out thank you so much for your support thank you for listening and as always do take care of yourselves the damcasters is hosted and produced by matt bow and is a bony abroad podcast production to learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.